Justin Sargent. Uh, when is Father's Day? Is it coming up or did it just pass? Sunday, thank you. Uh, this story is about my father. Um, well, it's actually about me, but it, it features my father, um, kind of the way that Glenn Gary Glenn Ross features Alec Baldwin. <laughs> uh, my father, I, I admire him a lot. Uh, he's, he's a real man's man. Grew up in Vermont, fisher, hunter, hiker. Uh, he can build anything out of anything. Um, and he's a doctor too, so he's got the smarts. Um, and uh, he's always been very supportive. He and my mother make a great team. I think they raise us pretty well. Um, very supportive um, all the time, came to all of our games, and um, even supported us uh, with the somewhat questionable decisions we made going into college. Um, I kind of tricked them uh, in terms of uh, major choice. I, I always told them I wanted to do classics, but I made it more palatable by saying I wanted to also study pre-law and become a lawyer. That's great. So after the first year, I was like, actually, I'm going to change that to computer science. Still okay. And I was like, after that, I changed it to linguistics and then English and then, you know. <laughs> but they uh, just kept supporting me through all that. <laughs> um, and they, uh, the college I went to was Duke University, which was um, a lot like four more years of high school. Uh, it's very uh, isolated from the surrounding community. They encourage you to live on campus. So I didn't have a job. I didn't. Uh, pay rent or anything like that. I was just, you know, kind of continued the whole uh, dependency thing. And uh, after college, I decided to move with my brother to New York City. Um, he was pursuing a career in acting and had a program there that he was participating in. Um, and I had nowhere better to be and it had some fancy ideas about being a writer or something. So I, I thought New York would be a good place to be. Um, but when you've never paid rent, never had a job, you're kind of going from zero to 60 by moving to New York City. Um, and I'm also somewhat of a country mouse, so again, um, a lot of culture shock. Um, I didn't, it didn't hit me right away. At first, it's just very exciting to be there. There's a real energy to New York City. Um, but after that initial excitement wore off, it just became really oppressive. <laughs> I remember in the first couple of days, uh, of the excitement. I just walked around downtown everywhere I could. I walked from like Harlem all the way to Battery Park and then back again, uh, which was exhausting. But it was it was exciting to see everything. Um, and at the time, we were still looking for a place. We eventually found one in uh, Washington Heights. Um, and the rent was, I think, like $1,300 a month. So uh, that didn't mean anything to me. I mean, I never had to pay rent. I never really had a job. Um, so. Everything was fine for a little while, but then I started to feel that responsibility weighing down on me. Um, and my brother was okay because he was in a program, so he was kind of, he had somewhere to be and something to do, and I had, I had nothing. I, I was looking for jobs. I had been to bartending school in college, but nobody in New York cares at all that you've been to bartending school. Um, <laughs> and so all the restaurants that I tried to get jobs at, nobody wanted me. Um, I tried briefly to substitute at some schools and that didn't really work out. Um, so I just ended up, uh, I remember walking through Midtown and looking up at the skyscrapers and just knowing that each building had hundreds and thousands of offices in it and each of them had people in them. And I was just wondering, what could they possibly be doing? That many people, I couldn't figure it out. And I just started hiding in my room in our apartment. And the weeks went by, and I had I had nothing to do and nowhere to go. And I would try to you know do some searches online, try to find something, but nothing was happening. And and I I would call my mother because both of my parents were supportive, but when you call for like a you know make me feel better kind of talk, I was usually talking to my mom. Um, and so. <laughs> These calls became somewhat regular a couple times a week, just calling like, help, help, what, what am I doing here? I, I, can't, I can't do this, and she you know, tried to butter me up and 
try to support me, like, oh no, you're great. Are you writing? You know, try to try to you know calm me down, and, and that would it worked pretty well. Um, but it just couldn't go on like that. Um, and eventually, I, uh, I reached a breaking point. My brother and I both did, um, and uh, we had already borrowed almost three thousand dollars from them. Well, I say borrowed. Um, that's just a euphemism for taking three thousand dollars <laughs> from our parents for their first month's rent and security deposit. And um, I, after after several weeks being unable to find a job, not knowing what to do, and just feeling this crushing mass of humanity, we decided we had to get out of New York and um, called the management uh, company and asked them how we could do that. And he was sick of us because you know, we had never rented before. Like, we sent our first rent uh, money in uh, as cash. And they had to call us specifically, tell us not to do that because the envelopes were open by machines and the money went by. <laughs> um, so he already didn't like us. Um, and he told us the only way to get out of the, of the lease was to buy it out. And so I was like, okay. And called up parents and said, uh, you know, we can't do it. You know, we tried, but we have to leave New York. So we need like $5,000 to buy the lease. And um, that's when my mom gave the phone to my dad. <laughs> and you might expect that, you know, he would, uh, you might expect that he would use the, the money as a reason to say no, but that's not what he did. He told me about his time in the Navy as a doctor, um, about how many times uh, young men would come into his office who had signed a contract joining the military, accepted all the benefits, and then when it came time for them to take their duty station, they would come to him to try and find a medical excuse to get out of it. And he said, I don't want you to be the kind of man who puts their name on something and then backs out. And these kind of coming of age moments, sometimes they happen slowly over time. And you look back and you realize that you've changed. And sometimes they happen like that. And this is one of those times where I, I heard the words. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I don't want to be that kind of man either. And so we, we stuck it out. And um, things got better. And I ended up spending two years there. And, Probably three quarters of the stories I've told at Extempo have come from my time in New York City. Um, so I, I really appreciate all the times in my life that my dad said yes and supported me. And I really, really appreciate the time that he said no. Thank you. Bill Story. Tuesday, I picked up my grandson on his last day of school and it got me to thinking about what it was like when I was in school. Back when I was in the third grade. I was incarcerated with my classmates at the little white schoolhouse on the corner of Route 15 and 128 Essex Center. All the other kids were at the main schoolhouse about 200 yards down 128 and for us kids at the little white schoolhouse it was like being on Alcatraz cut off from the mainland. And the warden of the prison was my third grade teacher, Mrs. Well, we called her Old Lady Asper. Yeah. It was 1968 and corporal punishment was alive and kicking at the little white school health. She had many ways to straighten us out. Like, for instance, if you gave her any lap or spoke out of turn, she'd make you stick your tongue out. And then she'd clip a clothespin onto it. Her favorite was uh, the old stand with your nose in the corner routine. Uh, crude but effective. But you know, it only made some of us want to rebel against her even more. John Patry spent a, a good deal of the third grade with his nose stuck in one corner or another. John was the unofficial ringleader of the loosely formed band of brothers that came to get into a annoy, pester, and piss off old lady Asper. She once made John roll a crayon across the floor with his nose. In retaliation, somebody I won't squeal. 
<laughs> put a tack on old lady Asper's desk here. I'm going to rise out of her. Well, the, the battle seesaw back and forth. Uh, headquarters for the resistance was down in the bathroom of the old schoolhouse, the boys' bathroom. Yeah. You went down about nine flight of nine steps to a little landing, then you turned nine degrees to the right, went down another three or four steps. On the right hand side there was a, a toilet stall, on the left hand side there was a, a sink. But right straight across from them last stairs, there was a, a long trough type urinal. And old lady Aspern had never invaded our sanctuary. And he was lulled into a false sense of security. <laughs> It happened late in the school year, a bunch of us guys were down in there, and John, he come up with this brilliant sort of challenge. Which one among us could piss the furnace? <laughs> so, Ray Porter went first. He started there in front of the urinal, and he's backing up, just whizzing away. He makes it right up to the first step there. You know, we're respectable, but we thought we had better candidates. So, Hub Roby went next. He starts squeezing one out the urinal, back straight up to them first steps, step straight up onto the first step there, still going strong. Probably could have gone farther. Of course, we was all laughing and squealing like eight-year-old boys tend to do. And it was my turn. Well, I start blasting away at the urinal. I back right up to that first step, step up onto the first one, still going strong. I quickly, with expert, I would just for Kentucky windage, step up onto that second step, still nailing it dead center. And suddenly, a, a dark shadow moves <laughs> And old lady Asper grabs me right by the scruff of the neck. Now, now trying to shut down the waterworks while you're going full bore is not a <laughs> Trying to shut it down and zip up while you're being drugged up a flight of stairs, that's even tougher. I get things zipped up and then shut down there, and she drags me into the classroom, skids my ass over to the corner there, shoves my nose in, but she lays down, she says to me, I can still remember her rank, coffee, cigarette, tainted breath in my face. And she says, you so much as twitch your head, one inch, one side or the other, and I'm going to paste you one you'll never forget. Well, I don't know how long I stood there with my nose in the corner. Lord knows I, I couldn't see a clock. I do know it was all the way through recess of most of English class. Boy, did I learn my lesson that day. <laughs> One that I could have applied for the whole school year. Hell for my whole life. And that lesson being, when it comes to a pissing contest, there really ain't no winners. <laughs> <laughs>
So the day before the girls were to arrive, I go to the grocery store and I buy a bunch of bad kid food, you know, that stuff that comes in blue and red boxes. I had every intention of introducing them to all the good vegetables in my garden and the wild blackberries that grew down in my meadow, but I knew that would take a little transition time. So the morning they're due to arrive, I go to the bus stop and I painted a bright sign that said, Welcome to Maury and Isis. And they pile off the bus and I load them into the car and they're just strapping in in the back seat when Kamori takes a look at Isis and says, She that old lady! <laughs> now, I want to be clear about this. I have to talk in their voices with their inflection or you won't get how clever and how funny these girls were. I mean, any disrespect by it. So the first morning they're at my house, I take them out after breakfast to meet my horse and show them how to take care of a horse. Of course, they're scared to death of her. But as soon as I get her in the stall and she's munching away on hay, they're fine. So I grab the muck rake and I go out and start cleaning up the horse poop. Oh, you want to touch that doodle? -doo? You want to touch that doodle? -doo? That's nasty. You can't touch that doodle. -doo? <laughs> of course, by the third day, they're fighting me for the muck rake. <laughs> but that was the birth of one of our expressions for the week. That's nasty. Usually followed by, oh, oh. <laughs> So a couple of days later, we go into Montpelier, we go to the farmer's market, we're wandering around town, we've been there for a couple of hours, when Kamori came over to me and she said, there are no black people in this town. How come Linda, there's no black people in Vermont? And I said, yes, there are African American people in Vermont, maybe not as many here as in other places, but there are. And so we're walking around town and after lunch, I see this darling African American couple with these two kids, probably eight and six. So I go to the girls and I said, see, there are African American families in Vermont. So that's Saturday. On Sunday, the next day, we're in Chelsea at this fair. And the same family is there. <laughs> Monday, we're at Queechy Gorge. And the same family is there. So, of course, Corey has it completely figured out. Comes over to me and she says, Libby, you painted that family to follow what's right. I miss a trick. <laughs> the week before they came up, I thought to myself, you know, I should probably be dry the week that they're here. You know, I don't know their family situations. I don't know how alcohol fits in or doesn't. This is not normal for me, but I decided, okay, I'm not the great father here. So the fourth night they're with me. We're helping out at a wine and cheese tasting at my, in my town, a little community event. And of course, I'm dipping into the samples of wine. So we get home that night, we flop down on the sofa, and we're watching these silly shows on TV, and then we start telling knock-knock jokes, and then we're making fun of each other's toes, and I'm drinking a couple more glasses of wine. We had a blast, sit up till like two in the morning. And the next morning at breakfast, Isis looks over at me with her wide little smile, and she says, ooh, Lily, you had five cups of wine last night. <laughs> and that same night spawned our, our one of our next catchphrases, which was, Linda, you owe oh, it, you fun. <laughs> so the night before the girls were to leave, I decided to take them to the contra dance at the Grange in Montpelier. And I've been to the dances before, and I knew they were a blast. But I wasn't real sure how they'd feel about dancing with, you know, sweaty old Vermont men with long, scraggly old white hands. <laughs> but they were great sports. They had so much fun. We stayed for four or five dances. They really seemed to enjoy themselves. But true to form, we get in the car to leave, and as soon as the door shut, Kamori starts in. The last guy she had danced was with this tall, thin, young guy with bare feet. Ooh, that old dog with his nasty old bare feet. He has some old scraggy toe. He's scratching me that old nasty scraggy toe. <laughs> and they just couldn't get anything past him. <laughs> so the next morning, I put him on the bus, and they head back to New York City, and I am exhausted. <laughs> and I tell anyone who will listen, do not let me ever do that again. <laughs> then I realized, for nine months straight, I told hilarious stories about my time with Kimori and Isis. And I knew I had to have them back. So sure enough, they came back last summer and we had so much fun. I mean, this is only half the stories. They're coming back this year for another week and I'm really looking forward to it. Which just goes to show you. When you think you're doing something to help somebody else, you end up benefiting yourself the most. And remember, I'm old, but I'm fun. <laughs>
Dina Frankel. So some years ago, I uh, did a freelance job where I got paid with an all expenses paid free trip to Jamaica to a um, resort, to a clothing optional resort. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But um, when I got there, I looked around and I realized this was really probably a big mistake. All of the guys that I could see were like bodybuilders from New Jersey. <laughs> Six-pack abs, hair gel everywhere, and this was definitely not my taste in men. <laughs> but, so I'm trying to figure out what to do, and I see this one guy who doesn't fit the stereotype. He's got a wild mane of blonde hair, pulled back with this piratical red bandana, and a luxurious mustache that just frames the most sensual mouth. <laughs> He's wearing like um, cut off jeans and boat shoes and his whole effect is sort of a um, hippie sailor. This is my taste. <laughs> so we just had this magnetic attraction. The two of us came together as like something out of the movies. You could like practically hear the violins. It turns out we've got uh, some things in common. Um, oh, well, I find out that this is Captain Jim. He's not actually a guest at the resort. He owns a, a sailboat that is used as a charter, takes guests from the resort out on day sails for $25 a head. And we, um, we find out we're both from Connecticut, we're both scuba divers, we both speak French, we both have memorized every Monty Python routine. Well, there's so much chemistry. He says to me, do you want to see the real Jamaica? The next thing you know, he's carrying my suitcase to my room and whisking me away on the back of his motorcycle. So he takes me to this magical place on the cliffs above the Caribbean where the waves thunder in under the cliffs and shoot up through these holes in the rocks and make these geysers into the sky. And then we get back on the bike and he takes me up into the mountains. And let me tell you, spending a few hours on the back of this straddling this motorcycle with my arms wrapped around this sexy stranger, it was stimulating. <laughs> for lunch at this little roadside shack that served uh, jerk chicken and salt fish and red striped beer. And while we're eating, Jim banters with the proprietor in this um, Jamaican patois that's so thick, it sounds more like reggae than English to me. And then when we're done, we, get a, we have a nice red striped buzz going here, and we get on the bike and head further up into the hills. So, as the afternoon goes on, the sky opens up and it rains like a monsoon. The road has gotten slick and so Jim pulls the bike off into this dirt track and as soon as we made the turn, we were just mired in the mud. So, we had no choice, we ditched the bike and we start hiking up this track. And there, in the jungle, is a tree house. It's really like this cottage built up into the canopy that belongs to an expatriate friend of Jim's. And so we, we are able to take shelter from the rain. Now, <laughs> you know where this is going, right? You can probably imagine that a young American tourist and a sexy sailor who are trapped in a tree house in the jungle for several hours while their clothes dry are not playing Yahtzee. <laughs> I, I, let me 
just put it this way, it was the most romantic afternoon of my life. <laughs> It was also um, uh, the beginning of one of the most romantic weeks of my life. I never really went back to the resort except to get my suitcase. <laughs> we swam and sailed and so forth. <laughs> the air was just full of the smell of jasmine and Jim made me feel like I was the center of the universe. The night before I was supposed to leave, he came to me and he asked for a favor. Would I bring a package back to the United States? <laughs> Strictly on the up and up, he said, but you know, I had been with this guy for a week now and I kind of trusted him. So the next day he brings me this package and it contains 480 $20 bills and they smell like dirt, like pirates. So here was his MO. He offered a $5 discount to the American tourists who paid for their boat rides in US currency, which was strictly illegal in Jamaica. And so he had amassed this huge pot, piles of $20 bills, which he kept buried in the front yard of his house. <laughs> And from time to time, he would befriend an American tourist, I suspect usually a female American tourist, and he would dig up just enough cash to stay under the $10,000 legal limit for bringing cash back into the United States. And he would ask them to mail the cash back to him at his home in the, in the States. So you know what I did? I took the cash. I flew back to Miami, and I FedExed it to him just like I had promised. Jim told me years later that he had never lost a penny in this tax shelter scheme. I don't know why no one just kept, didn't just keep the cash, but I tell you, it never crossed my mind. Now, I've probably made you think that he was kind of a scoundrel and a user, but you know, he and I, 30 some years later, are still good friends. We traveled all over the world together. He's one of the most stand up guys I've ever met. And that was the end of my smuggling career. Thank you. <laughs> Rob Squire. <laughs> my story begins in. Uh... 1920s, when a real estate developer in Los Angeles decides to build a community that he calls Beverly Hills. But apparently the first several houses don't sell very well, so he needs to up the marketing. And so he reaches out to the great movie star Will Rogers and asks Will Rogers if he would be the mayor of the town. And uh, Will Rogers says, no, I wouldn't be a member or even the mayor of any town that doesn't have a church. So. Very quickly, the developer uh, sets three very prominent lots right in the middle of Beverly Hills and donates the land to the Presbyterian, Episcopal, and Catholic churches. And the churches are built, and they're there today. And if you go there, you can see the Presbyterian, Episcopal, and Catholic churches right on Santa Monica Boulevard. So fast forward uh, to the mid-1990s. I arrive in Los Angeles, and I start having a really great time. I'm going out at night, going out to nightclubs, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and so I figure out, Squire, you gotta get, you gotta get right here, and uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll go to church on Sunday and uh, try to just clean this act up a little bit. <laughs> so not being from any particular religious tradition, I just walk into the first church that I saw, <laughs> and I, I go in, I, and I, and all the people are way down front. They're up in the first couple of pews, and I kind of quietly and sheepishly kind of sit towards the back mind my own business, I'm just sitting there. But uh, there's a moment in the service when you're supposed to stand up and bid the people beside you peace. But there's nobody near me. But I kind of look around, and as quiet as a little mouse, this man had crept in during the service and sat down right behind me. But it's not just a man. It's Jimmy Stewart, okay? 
the Jimmy Stewart. And I look at Mr. Stewart, I say, I'm a bit of peace, and these people up front are all taking a lot of time, so kind of whisper and talk, and I said, I'm Rob Squire, and he says, I'm J -J -J Jimmy Stewart. And I said, yes, yes, you are, you are Jimmy Stewart, that's right. <laughs> Completely geeking out, because I've been a big fan of Jimmy Stewart my whole life, and it's just, it's just a great moment. And, and I've just been peace with Jimmy Stewart, and then a couple of minutes later in the service, they want you to hold hands with the people next to you and pray. But there's you know, no one around me, so I turn around, and I'm holding Jimmy Stewart's hand, and we're praying together. You know, give us this day our daily bread, and I'm sitting here with this man, and I'm like, this is incredible. I didn't know church was like this. I feel like I had died and gone to heaven, and here I am, and I'm like, this is great. I'm going to come every week. I'm going to get to know Jimmy, and we're going to start hanging out. We'll sit and pray with Jimmy Stewart. So this is great. And so I think I'll catch him at uh, coffee and donuts after service, and we'll make this thing a regular thing. But Jimmy slips out before the end of the service. He leaves just as quiet as he came in. But that doesn't deter me. I decide I'm coming back next week. So I came back next week. I go to church. Jimmy doesn't show up. And I figure, well, he must be sick. I come back the next week. Jimmy doesn't show up. Oh, he must be on vacation. I show up again the fourth week. Jimmy doesn't show up. I'm like, this is a long vacation. But I keep going back. Jimmy never shows up again. But I keep going back, and I start making friends, and I get active in the community, and I actually get confirmed in the church. And suddenly, the... Uh, you know, the rector of the church and the bishop of L.A. come to me and they say, Hey, Rob, have you ever thought about doing this professionally? Like, what? They're like, you know, join the clergy. I'm like, no. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, we've got a lot of pull at Yale and we've kind of spoken to them. There's a spot for you at the Divinity School. Why don't you go check it out? So the rector and I fly to New Haven. We go, I take the tour, I do the interviews and all that, and they tell me, yeah, we've got this spot for you, you know, there's just this little formality, you've got to finish up the application. So I go back to LA with this application. That's right at this time that I discover why Jimmy Stewart is not in church, and why Jimmy Stewart is never going to be in church. And that's because the first week I went to church, I walked into the Presbyterian church. The second week, I walked into the Episcopal church. <laughs> The whole time I'm waiting for Stuart, he's next door. <laughs> to make matters worse, now I've got this application, and I swear to God that the first question, the first question on the application says, what is it about your religious journey and your search for God that has brought you to the Episcopal Church? <laughs> I had to do it. I wrote, I didn't come to the Episcopal Church looking for God. I came looking for Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> And you don't have him. I wrote that, I signed it, I mailed it in. They did not accept my application. I did not join the clergy, and instead I moved to Montpelier. Yeah.